Hi. How's it going? <laughs> Good. I can't um, see anyone. Is this room empty? <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Um, thank you everybody for joining us. I am so excited to be here and so excited to ask you as many questions as I can fit into one hour and, and there will be time for audience questions at the end. Deb, I was just telling you um, off stage how many of your recipes I've cooked in the last year, so thank you for everything that you do. I'm amazed. And this is book three. It so is. exciting. Um, you. Can you tell us, did the theme come first? Did some of the recipes come first? Did the deadline come first? How did this bug <laughs> happen? Too realistic, the deadline came first. <laughs> no, I um, the, the theme came a long time ago. I always wanted to write a cookbook called Keepers because it's always been the center of what I want from a recipe. When I started cooking many, 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 many years ago now, I realized I just wanted my forever recipes, like the, the last version of something. I didn't want to go hunting. If I'm hungry for something, I'm like, oh, I already have a great chicken parm. Oh, I have the perfect pound cake. Make this one. So I was always looking for that, and that was a lot of why I started Smitten Kitchen. But so I always wanted to write a book called Keepers, but I was afraid to because you are just begging for every recipe <laughs> to be a one star. Like, this was not a keeper for me. <laughs> I mean, I just like set it a little bit lower, and I could be like, write a book of good recipes, and then there's less argument. Try but, them once. You know, Keeper is like just begging for people to be like, well, it actually wasn't. So I was a little bit scared. And then I got over it, and here we are. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful book. I'm Thank sure you. if you've had a chance to flip through it, y'all all agree with me. Um, how did you decide something was a keeper? Was there something, maybe I'll ask, was there a criteria that you used to weed something out? Yes. I hated making it. <laughs> Fair. I have my own recipes that I hate making. And I think that's a, a very good, you know, like top level thing where if I am procrastinating about testing the recipe because I don't want to make, if I don't want to make the recipe, why would anybody else want to? It's crazy. Like, so I use that as a gut because I enjoy cooking, but I'm also lazy and tired and, you know, like just sometimes just don't feel like it. Sure. Um, so that's usually when the steps start to go. Like I wait so long to start the recipe that we really like need it for dinner in about 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, it turns out you can make it in one bowl. And it turns Incredible. out you can put it on one pan. <laughs> and it turns out if you blast the oven really high, it gets done faster. So these are the things that you learn if you procrastinate as much as I do. <laughs> And um, things like that, like a sheet pan, um, I think you have a sheet pan from the Ray Chicken recipe that I make with paneer all the time. Like things like that, one bowl, one pan, like you have to think about that from the very beginning of recipe development and sometimes maybe that comes at the end, like, oh, okay, this is, this is good, but this is what's really gonna take it over the top. I'm curious, are there things like that, there's, there's so much that goes into recipe development. Okay, what kind of salt are people getting at home? Like, mm -hmm. what, um, you know, what about kitchen times? Like, how long is it gonna take for people to caramelize onions or, mm -hmm. or do whatever the thing is? What about temperatures? Like, are there things like that, like, that you hate? Like, when I test recipes, I hate having to time myself doing anything because I'm slow. Yeah, I'm so, I'm really <laughs> slow. It takes me forever. I can work on, sometimes it takes me like an entire day to make like a 20 or 30 minute recipe <laughs> because I'm very like analytical about each step and I'm writing things down. Sometimes I'm taking pictures. There's a lot going yeah. on and I'm, I'm slow. I'm very slow. So I hate timing it. I would definitely say that salt is the bane of my mm -hmm. existence because I both want our food to be correctly seasoned and I want to give us a ballpark of how it's going to get there. Like a teaspoon is gonna give you the flavor you need, but also every single salt weighs something different. And I mean, then you have to have these footnotes about the brand of salt you're using. And um, we did, I did put one of those in this book. Um, it's actually in the very beginning, but I hate, I, even writing that was agony. <laughs> Hard. Um, and flour measurements mm. are the other one that just drives me crazy. And you do cups and grams. I do cups and grams, but there's a lot of, um, Guys, baking is so easy. Why does everyone make baking complicated? But also, your cup of flour should weigh 135 grams, unless you're using a Cook's Illustrated recipe, in which case it's 120 grams. Like, I mean, <laughs> why, yes, I understand why people don't want to bake at home. <laughs> so those are just like little nitpicky things. But I would definitely say that the overall, like, do I have to put this on the stove if it's going in the oven? Do I have to put it in the oven if it's going on the stove? Is this extra bowl worth it? It's always like the bigger thing. This year, um, we, my husband and I brought 
a kitchen scale home to my parents for the very first time oh, and left it there, and it's changed the world. Really? Our lives. Yeah. They didn't I just like were like, "What is this thing? I measure with my heart." We, yeah, like for coffee, for flour. <laughs> wow. They were just kind of flying blind, and now it's there, tucked away in a closet for us to use. We've okay. <laughs> for us. It's amazing. I love weighing things. Yeah. It's very reliable. Cups. Very they'll, they'll never. They'll never do you like cups. Like like a, like a, a weight is a very standard thing. It's iconic. Game changer. <laughs> Um, when, another kind of question in, in that regard, when do you include substitutions for ingredients and when do you not? How do you think about that? I know people kind of think differently. Um, that's definitely something that I've picked up over the years from like what people want to swap things with. I know that like, for example, which is the reason I also have a bandaid on my thumb is fennel <laughs> because I forgot how to cut fennel last night. Um, <laughs> fennel is very divisive. So if I have fennel, I will try to explain why it's there and also let you know when there's something that it would work for fennel. There is, by the way, not something that's fennel-like that's not fennel. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one, but I'll yeah. definitely mention it if there's something I can think of. And um, yeah, I always try to mention swap, you know, something like, because I that's that's the bulk of comments and yeah. emails are like, can I swap this for this? So if there's an easy one, I'll mention it, but you get to a point where you don't want to have 82 footnotes of every single thing Fair. that could ever be swapped. Fair. So there's, there's a balance. I will say um, I am a, I'm a read the recipe all the way through before I cook it. Oh. Cook sometimes, sometimes. Yes, you have. Um, and I love it when you have notes at the end of your recipe. Okay, <laughs> like I made these um, rainbow cookies and I learned don't ever stack them, right? Or I learned <laughs> that you should keep it in the fridge before you cut it. And I find those so helpful. So thank you. Thank you for all the detail of cooking. I'm not really good at reading recipes at the end <laughs> before I make them. I'm like, I've got this. I know, I know how to do this. I <laughs> totally know years. how to do this. And then I completely blow it. So. Love but that. I'm glad to hear that other people do things yeah. correctly. That's, that's the right way. <laughs> um, another thing that I love about your book is that for me, it feels like you're really trying to make it easy for people to use up what they have at home. So I told you this earlier, I have a, there's a chickpea masala recipe in your cookbook, chana masala, one of my favorite dishes of all time. I cook it's it like all the time. It's like you're making my chickpea masala. <laughs> I love cooking other people's recipes, and yours is, I mean, you make it so easy, right? Like there's canned chickpeas in there, which is great, but also it calls for um, like 14 ounces of crushed tomatoes. And where I live, I can only get the big 28 ounce cans oh, of crushed wow. tomatoes. And so I always have half a can like languishing in my fridge that I need to use up right away. And, no. and so it's great because I'm like, oh cool, I always have chickpeas, I always have half a can of tomato sauce, I can make this chana masala, a dish that I love. And Look, I made that because I wanted you to be able to use the smaller can. Oh, I can't, I can't find them. <laughs> You're gonna have to. We're in different it. neighborhoods, so oh, we're no. gonna have to compare notes on, on where we're doing our grocery oh, no. shopping. But in Park Slope, I can't find them anywhere. Um, might just be me. Well, I'm glad you're, I'm happy to put it to use. It's also really good with fresh tomatoes too, which True. is yeah, something yeah. I've learned and, from other cookbook authors. And you but. call, you call for, not that I've memorized this recipe all already, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you call for diced or fresh or crushed, <clears throat> which I really appreciate. Um, but what I noticed, excuse me, I'm just gonna drink some water. Um, I feel like I should like sing yeah. or something. I, I, can't, I will Stand not up. sing. <laughs> Every time I type signing, I spell it singing, and I'm just terrified one day that someone's gonna get the wrong idea, the worst, the worst possible idea. Um, Deb, what's your uh, go-to karaoke song? Um, Midnight Train to Georgia? Yeah. <laughs> but that's like me. really late. I know it took me a long time to think about that one, right? Amazing. It, that's gotta be very late. No, really. Um, okay, Put well, your in. <laughs> so I was going to say, like, maybe you developed that recipe thinking about people like me who apparently are grocery shopping in the wrong places, but <laughs> I'll give you another example. I also just made your so soy glazed tofu, and it serves three, and you kind of note very specifically this doesn't serve as many people as other recipes in my book because I wanted to use one block of tofu, and that is how you made it, and I think that's so smart and so thoughtful, and I'm curious do you ever develop recipes to solve problems like that or do you ever have something languishing in your fridge all the time and so that's like the inspiration or does that always kind of come later? I am always trying to use up packages. I didn't, I wasn't always this obsessed with it with, with this book in particular. I was like no four ounces of spinach. They Love come in these five ounce clamshells. I don't know why they come in five ounces, it's not four ounces, but the f <laughs> if, it can, if it can work with five ounces, I want to find out. I hate when there's only like a cup of beans used and the can is like a cup and yeah. three quarters or a cup and a half, so I'm always trying to use up the whole amount because I hate the leftovers. I always have, like, raise your hand <laughs> if you have like a can of tomato paste in your fridge oh or like God. a piece of boiler <laughs> and like probably something growing on the surface because it happens like in about 36 hours after you open it. I use the tubes. I do like the tubes. They're a lot more expensive I though. And mine always leak, so I have to keep them in a baggie. Okay, I, it can't just be me. 
Um, but yes, I, I am a big fan of the tubes. But yeah, no, I just feel like this is just, these are universal yeah. things. So if there's some way that you could use the whole can of tomato paste, which is actually quite a lot for a recipe, <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm gonna try. I am, um, I love a hack, and I always, like on TikTok or whatever, I always see people freezing their tomato oh. paste in little ice cube trays. I see those people, I want to be those I'm people. Not that person, I'm not that person. Maybe, maybe all maybe of us can year. become that person. It's not too late to make resolutions, right? I'm gonna be that person this yeah. year. <laughs> I, I believe in you, keep us posted, we'll be following along on Instagram. Um, also curious, what are some of the common, easily avoidable kitchen mistakes that you, an expert and professional, make all the time? <laughs> I'll give you an example. Like, I usually do a big batch cook on Sunday for the whole week, and so I'm making three or four dishes at once for lunches and for dinners, because during the week I don't have time to cook. Um, and so I miss a lot of stuff. I like, um, how do you, like, I like met out all the, you know, I chop all my onions and my wow. garlic and whatever because I'm cooking so many things, and then I'll like mess it up. I'll be like, oh, this needs garam masala and chili, and I'll put the garam masala in some onions and the chili in other ones, and then I've like totally messed up. Oh my gosh. See, see, this is why I just don't even try. Oh. Yeah, I just, I would never, I could never I be that this organized. Was be, that was I'm my, a like, single focused person. Wow, I can okay. only do like one dish at a time. I really. Interesting, do you meal prep? No. But you're always cooking for work though. That's no, the I don't meal prep. Like I should, no, okay, so last night I made the, um, I don't know, this green spaghetti. Beautiful. I made it. Um, but that's also because I was making a beef stew, and which I did my thumb on. Um, anyway, so I was making a beef stew, and I was making the green stew, and that was a lot for me. That that's was a lot. But that's what that I'm was saying. a lot of executive functioning for me, <laughs> trying to master it. It was mostly because I had not read the beef stew recipe to the end, and turned out it took a couple more hours than I thought it would, which is really funny Incredible. because you think I would know how long it takes to cook beef stew. I have a couple recipes, but I was making a different one. Anyway, so know. green spaghetti it was. <laughs> Love that. So but no, I'm not, I'm not organized at all. Um, I just, I, I feel like I just cook one thing at a time and I just focus on that and then I cook something else. That is why your recipes are so good. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not so good. I guess it, I just don't like having a lot of things going on because I will kind of like jumble it up. I also don't have a lot of space. I think if I had multiple counters, mm. I hear this is a thing that happens in people's kitchens. Mm. I haven't quite personally <laughs> experienced it. But maybe one day if I have multiple counters, I'll have like a little bit of thing going on each. But I'll probably just have a bunch of stuff on each counter that needs to be put away and then there's the yeah. one I use. <laughs> um, are there things that you like keep in the fridge that you know you're not supposed to or that you always keep out that you know you're supposed to store differently? Absolutely. Okay, so I keep peanut butter in the fridge. I don't know why. I, I just Are you don't? not supposed to keep peanut butter in the fridge? No, I just think you don't need to. Like there's no reason okay. for it. Um, I keep... Um, Yes, we keep soy sauce in the fridge. I don't even know why. I, we just started doing it, and now it's just always there. And I, I don't, I don't know. Like I don't have answers for everything. It feels safer. Yeah, I don't like, know. That's just where it is. Um, and what else do we? I don't know. I keep, but I keep random things at room temperature. Like, eggs. No, maybe in Europe, but not here. Please don't keep your eggs at room temperature in America. <laughs> Only the European eggs. Um, I keep. Oh God, this is so specific, but like when we're like, when the fridge is really jammed up, because I'm, have overcommitted and, you know, don't have space, um, jam always goes out. There's really, it doesn't have to be in the fridge. And the other thing I always, this is very, 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 very specific, but we love those Luxardo cherries for Manhattans. And I keep those at room temperature. I don't know if you're supposed to, but they've been fine for years. <laughs> <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> um, butter? Sorry. Butter is fine at room temperature, but my apartment is, I have a steam heated apartment, so it would not be fine at my room temperature. Um, that's not butter anybody needs to eat. Those um, radiators. Yeah, it would just be, it would be, <laughs> the butter would be soft at all times and ready for the recipe. Have you ever tried to defrost something on top of your radiator? Oh my God, yes, absolutely. Same. Yeah, absolutely. Same, same. I can defrost things very quickly in my apartment. The so one part it has like clanking. It has its, it has its purpose. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so warm in our apartment all the time, but I am. Um, I forget that the rest of the world isn't like this, and so I've been traveling a lot, and I'll, I'll be in a hotel room in like a normal climate. I'm like, why is it so cold in here? Oh, is this is this what 72 feels like? I've <laughs> never experienced it before. Um, you've been traveling quite a bit on book tour, a little bit, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, what do you, do you ever like bring the same snacks with you every time? Do you kind of have your routines? Is there always a food you're sneaking out? You're giving me a look, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I really, I'm really coming off very good tonight. I bring no <laughs> snacks. I never Incredible. plan ahead, and I'm always like, man, I'm hungry. I should have got, brought some food. <laughs> it's terrible. Okay, so definitely, listen, I'm not a lifestyle girl, okay? And I think that's pretty clear. Um, 
But um, I do always look for, I look for something fun though when I get there. I'm trying to find like something interesting to try. Okay. I also find, because the alternative is I do always have work to do, but if I just go to the hotel room and work for a couple hours and then go to the event, it just feels like too work worky, yeah. worky work. <laughs> very, very professional here. <laughs> um, so it's nice to find something local to like anchor you to the place that yeah. you're in. So I usually venture out and try to find something interesting. Even just a grocery store. I love yeah. going to grocery stores in other countries and especially. I love seeing like what kind of jam is front and center and the different kinds of butter and mm. oil and all of it. Those room temperature eggs. Package sizes of lettuce is very a core <laughs> interest of mine. <laughs> Fascinating, <laughs> learning a lot. Um, you are a cookbook author and a very good one, but you also read a ton of cookbooks. Mm -hmm. I see this on your Instagram, I see you flipping through them, I see you kind of giving a lot of shine to other books, and I'm curious, what in your mind makes a, I'm, I think we probably have some aspiring writers mm -hmm. and recipe developers out here, what kind of makes a great cookbook to you? I think a good cookbook is, I mean, there's a lot of, it, it depends on what you're looking for. Some people just like a good reading book. You know, yeah. there are people, I didn't actually know about this until I wrote my first one, but people keep cookbooks on their nightstands. Like it's their evening oh, cool. reading. And so they may, they may cook from it, they may not. They might just absorb the idea into their cooking, but they are not maybe recipe cooks. They like to read them. So it could be really good for reading. I love a cookbook that kind of takes me somewhere else. You know, where I love reading about a very specific place and, and learning a bit about the food and the culture and like a, a trip there. So I love like learn, getting a little piece of the world that I wouldn't otherwise get. I love that. Any specific favorites coming out this I'm year? That you like? I always freeze and then I'm like, um, the you know the I one with the cover, the one, the one with the cover on it and the pretty food. Um, I, I some uh, beautiful cookbooks. There's some beautiful really cookbooks happy. out right now. We were just talking about Eric Kim on yeah. History in American. I, I think that might even be. Is that a 2022 book or? I wish I could tell okay. you what time was. Like, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> um, that's a wonderful book, yeah. um, and I loved learning about his Korean home cooking and the yeah. food he grew up with, and I love the mix of sort of fun stuff he puts with it too. Yeah. There's so many great cookbooks out right now. And you've now done three and they're all great. And I'm <laughs> curious, um, how did you decide to arrange? So you, you had a theme mm -hmm. and then you had a list of recipes and how did you decide what order to put them in? Did you play around with it? Did you try a couple of different things? How did Definitely you a lot of playing around. So something that's different in this book is that there's a very long vegetable section and it was so big, I wanted to divide it up somehow. And I ended up dividing it into what I call small, medium, and large vegetables, which is weird because they're not actually small, medium, or large vegetables, but <laughs> let me explain. <laughs> but the idea was that, this is something that comes up with vegetarian cooking and ve vegetable cooking all the time is, but is it a meal or yeah. is it a side dish? And I hate it because I know that most of us are perfectly happy having a roasted sweet potato for dinner, even if it may not be like a meal and for somebody else it might be a side dish. And I didn't want to get into the labeling of it. So the small vegetables are things that somebody could call a side dish, but I think could make a really nice, like simple lunch, you know, such as oven sweet potato fries. Mm -hmm. And there's a few other really fun things in there. And then there's the medium vegetables, which are things that you could also eat for a smaller meal or you could combine it with something else. It would definitely feel like a substantial one. And then the large vegetables are things that I think we immediately recognize as mains, like a vegetable lasagna is like clearly a main. So that was what I did with it. <laughs> um, but there was, there's so much, there are so many conversations and emails and phone calls with editors and the team behind the scenes just trying to figure out the right way to get this so it makes sense for everybody. <laughs> I love that and I hadn't seen something like that before and some of those like the sweet potato fries or is there a um, Brussels sprout ricotta toast? Mm -hmm. Could be an appetizer, Absolutely. could be called something, but I love that it's kind of like small, medium, thing. it felt something I would totally eat fresh. that for dinner though. Yeah. Like in Brussels sprout yeah. toast, why not? It's got, it's got bread, it has Perfect. ricotta, it has like a nut, it's, nice. it's got like something green. <laughs> Maybe not for like a family of four, but like it could be. Yeah. So, yeah. I make your broccoli toast quite a bit. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's talk about some of your other favorite recipes from the book. I have a hundred favorites. <laughs> no, wait, I like to tell people I have 99 favorites, but I won't tell you which one I don't like. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's up to you to figure out. <laughs> um, the walnut brittle cookies look amazing. I love those. I did not, I always, I did not think I would ever write a chocolate chip cookie recipe. Fascinating. Because there are so many good ones out there and I've done versions of so many great ones on my site. I felt like, you know, this conversation's good. We've covered everything that can be said about chocolate chip cookies has <laughs> already been said. But then, I 
and I was like, what? If I looked deep inside my own heart for what I consider the perfect chocolate chip cookie, it's actually none of these. Okay. And that's where I was like, oh, here we go. I'm gonna have to write the chocolate chip cookie recipe. <laughs> so what it is, the main thing that sets it apart is that it has um, walnuts in it, but they are brittled walnuts. So you make this quick caramel. I know all of you are just like, forget it, it's never gonna happen, but it's the easiest. It, you make it sound very it's easy. It's so easy, you cannot mess it up, and you just coat the walnuts with it. You just freeze it for five, about 10 minutes, and then they're all crunchy, and then you crush those up, and it gives you both, I feel like, the nut, but also that salty, crackly crunch that I think that a lot of cookies are missing. And it's pretty tall as a cookie, but not not quite Levan tall, but like it's got a nice height to it. And this is also very key for me, is that you can cook it right away. Because I have never once decided to schedule a chocolate chip <laughs> cookie craving one to three days in advance. When I want a chocolate <laughs> when I want a chocolate chip cookie, I want it as soon as possible. <laughs> um, so it was really important to me that it worked right away. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else I found really interesting that I haven't cooked yet. I loved your black bean chili. There's a soy glazed tofu that's really great. The chana masala is excellent. Um, I tried the bread's version of the Bialy Babka, and I, I thought uh, maybe that's something interesting. So Bread's Bakery here in New York, they made a version of your babka mm -hmm. before your book came out. And is, is it correct as before? Um, so I think they started running it around Thanksgiving, so it was just after, just after. Okay. and then they ran it through the end of the year. So I think that they don't have it anymore, so I don't want to upset anyone if you go there, but you can tell them to bring it back, that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, so we, did, we did a mashup, so it's basically the filling for my babka, but it's with their babka dough, which Got is it. definitely not the same. It's, it's um, a laminated, it's more of a Danish dough, so it's very light and airy and extremely buttery. Yeah. Um, but, but what's it like to see your, your recipes, your, you cook for home cooks, you're a cookbook author, first and foremost for now, you do a lot of many other great things. What's it like to see something like that out in a restaurant or in a bakery? Is it, it was so cool. cool, it was really fun. I also had a lot of fun when they were like, well, here's a sample of it, what do you think? Yeah. I'm like, what do I think? I, ha I actually had a really good time learning okay. how they work, seeing their operations. It's just incredible what they do there. Yeah, it's awesome. just incredible that they just, they bring in their butter from France because that's what they use for their croissants and nothing else, like gold work. They, there's so many things I learned. They make everything there. They make their challah with one rope. They have a special knot that they developed where they can make a th like it look like a, a braid with one strand. It's amazing to watch. So I, I enjoyed, I enjoy hanging out in bakeries. Do you have a bakery? Can I hang out? <laughs> it won't be weird or anything. I'll just be snooping around, being like, "What are you doing? What are you? Can I take a picture?" <laughs> the scale is so different. Like that's yeah. the thing that you know, butter in pounds instead of butter in tablespoons and things like that. Yeah. It's just out of control. They make their hamantashen with these um, hexagon cutters that are tessellated. So there's no waste of dough, and that's how they, it's so cool. Tessellated sounds like a Mr., like a Doctor Who word for me, like a wrinkle It's, it's why, I think, why are all cookie cutters not tessellated? Which is to say they're like locked into a pattern with no wasted space. Um, I just feel like this is a thing that should exist. There are some, but like it should be all of them. Makes so you don't have to, no re, no re chilling and re-rolling scraps. Who's got time for that? <laughs> Um, one thing we were talking about a little bit before this is that is it just that kind of question of who owns a recipe, mm. right? Like who gets to cook what, who gets to say I developed this first. So many things have inspiration that's rooted in specific cultures. So many things have um, are developed kind of concurrently all at the same time. Mm. It's really tricky to say who owns this. Something that we talk about at work is like you don't own like a recipe title, like you, there's no like IP that you can kind of mm -hmm. own with that. I think it's so interesting. You've always had a very specific approach to recipes. Um, you always kind of source and credit other developers. It seems from the outside like something that's very important to you that you take very seriously, which I appreciate. You also cook broadly, of course, from a, a wide range of flavors. I just made your um, your chana masala, your chickpea masala. <laughs> I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about your approach. I'm curious how it's changed in the 16 years that you since you've started <laughs> Smitten Kitchen, and especially in the last couple years when I think we're all thinking about this um, Absolutely. so much more. Absolutely. I feel like we've been having some really important and long overdue conversations about where recipes come from, who gets to cook them, who gets credit for them, and what it means when you use the title of a recipe and it's not really that recipe. So I do not have anything figured out. <laughs> I am not, I do not the person who has the answers to all of this, but I will say that almost all of these problems can be avoided or resolved by simply sourcing your work. 
by simply saying, wow, I didn't invent chana masala, not even close. I didn't even grow up eating it. Here's where I've learned to make it. I learned this from this person and this from this person. And I think that it doesn't just make the story better, it makes the recipe better. But we, I guess we can only reverse that. We already know the recipe is good for that. I think it also makes for a more interesting story. I want to hear where food is coming from. I want to hear what inspires you and what makes this different because you pulled this from here and this from this and maybe this from an Italian chef. It doesn't matter. That's, that's your point of view. That's what makes it unique. And I think it's really cool to bring it in. Yeah, totally. Um, and also, it really keeps and ensures that every voice gets heard. Um, it's not, you know, I, I, didn't invent, I didn't invent lasagna <laughs> and anything. All I have is something I wanted to try that I picked up somewhere else that I want to try with this and then I played around with it in my kitchen and I did this. Yeah. That's a head note. Yeah, and That's I all mean, of them. <laughs> kind of on, on the topic of head notes, like there's a, a huge, um, <laughs> shall I say, conversation right now around how long they should be mm -hmm. and how we should get, you knew where I was going with this, how we should <laughs> lead into recipes. I love your head notes. I like them in your books. I like them on your website. I think you do a really good job showing um, some personality and talking a little bit about the story, sourcing where appropriate, uh, but they're also not super long. And I, and I think as, a, as somebody who's been blogging on the internet for, again, 16 years with Smitten Kitchen, you could have gone that route. You could have gone really, really long, you know, scroll forever and ever and ever. And sometimes you tell stories or sometimes you show a lot of photos, and talk, but you're talking about the recipe itself. I'm just curious, how are, do you feel like you've got it right? I'm sure you do. I think you have. Like, how much I have you I thought about it? I everything figured out. Thank you very much. <laughs> how much have you experimented? What's your take? I feel like I'm actually trying to always tighten it. I Make feel like my, my head notes used to be longer, and I'm constantly, because I'm like, if it could be said well in five sentences, could I say it better? And, four sentences. So I'm actually usually trying to tighten and tighten where the first draft is the longest, yeah. but I I love a packed paragraph of a lot. I like I want to hear I want to hear it all. And again, you can just you can just skip to the recipe. Yeah. It's fine. I'm not like in any way offended if somebody doesn't want to read my drip laptop, but I love talking about where the recipe came from and why it matters and why this recipe and why now and why this ingredient and why not this ingredient and why you didn't use this technique. I could just, I love all of that yeah. stuff. And I love to hear how you ate it and who was there and what was the bad joke they told. Like I want all of it. So you can tell me, you can send me the longest head notes. I'm here for it. But I think at times, I think what people are complaining about, it can feel padded for some reasons where there's a lot of stuff. And that is really, I think the wrong people are being blamed for that. This is this is a this is a thing that like Google rewards. This isn't something that writing awesome. rewards. Yeah. So, um, and the truth is that I would probably have much better SEO if I did what however weird way Google wants recipes written, but I don't do it. So, I had a whole meeting today about SEO keywords. So <laughs> you must you must have quite a few that you have to hear about. Yeah. It does not. It's not good for writing, is no, it? It's, it's not, not good for reading either tricky and hopefully it'll change but I one thing I love about your head notes is you talk about what you got wrong when you were developing or what you didn't like or okay these cookies were too brittly you know mm -hmm. and now they're going to be like whatever the example is and I think that's so valuable and I think seeing the photos of the different stages and things like that are also so helpful and it really feels like you are you're not developing recipes for an algorithm you're not developing recipes for like our google overlords no knock to any google <laughs> overlords who might be here you want like you're developing them for the home cook and that's so rare it feels yeah. not to chase something but i think the process is really interesting especially for people who are passionate about cooking and a lot of times the process answers the questions like logically speaking why wouldn't you do it this way why would you let me tell you why because i did try it that way and i thought this would work and i thought this would and so you know obviously not every single thing that happened needs to be in the final head note but i think it's really interesting talking about like where you started how you thought it would go and like how it got there for me that's the interesting part so that's why it's in my head notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think they're Thank great. Thank you. Um, and I think about head notes quite a bit. Um, let's talk about social media. So social media, we love it. We, um, you know, there's so much of it and it's very complicated. I'm curious, you do social video, you are very active on Instagram, your Instagram stories. I, we haven't spent that much time together in person, but I do feel like I know you, which is like, you know, maybe a little problematic, but like, no. I feel like I see so no. much of, of your work. I won't say of your life, but of the, of the life that you choose to share with us. And I think that's so special and I think it probably helps people connect to your recipes in some interesting ways. I'm just curious, like you're doing video now, you're doing social video, mm -hmm. you're doing some YouTube video. How 
has that changed your approach to recipe development? Has it changed your approach to recipe development? Are you ever like, oh my god, I need something to go viral? Is that not something? Is that something you have the luxury of not having to think about? I want to know it all. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so. It mostly gives me many new ways to procrastinate every day, Love which that. I appreciate, because I'm like, well, I'm not procrastinating, I'm editing video. I'm working on an Instagram <laughs> caption. Great. Um, but I do all my own social media, which is weird and That's I think cool. rare. But I also am like, what am I gonna do? Like teach somebody else to write a caption that's not like this just that's not gonna work so and certainly with the traveling it's been really fun to share bits and pieces yeah. of like the random trouble I get into or things that happen or like when snowflakes that are shaped like snowflakes fall on my sleeve in Minnesota and I was like I don't think I've ever been so excited about anything <laughs> <laughs> which is really I don't know what that says about my life but it was amazing um, or like spotting ducks outside LaGuardia Airport Ducks? Yeah. Geese, I think. Cool. Apparently, they're really mean, and I wouldn't want to get close to them. But um, yes, I get. So I love this stuff, and I love that I have a place to share it. But you were asking about how I run, how I use it for Smitten Kitchen, and the answer is that I mostly, for me, the site is still the center of what I do, and everything I'm doing is an arrow pointing back there. The recipe is there. The recipe is not on Instagram, it's not on Twitter, it's on the site. So it's an hour, but I also really like the conversations that happen in other places. So I think it's more like if people wanna be on TikTok, I will be on TikTok. Yeah, I really mind being on TikTok, <laughs> I love TikTok. <laughs> but mo most of the things are just like, if the people want their information here, I will be here. And so it's just about trying to reach, but there's many branches on the tree these days. Yeah. So it's not, it's a lot. It's not as simple as just like popping a little update into the Facebook bar and then going back to your regular life. But I think of it as supportive to the recipe and I also think I really, as I said, I like the separate conversations that happen and the things you can do on each social media differently. And it makes, um, it can help people cook better, right? Like I think there's, it's, it's so much about you know, reaching new audiences and driving people back to the site, but also I've, I've seen people say, oh, okay, like I watched her make this thing and now I know I can make this thing, right? It's and I think really that's nice really special. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice to be able to do the quick demos too. Yeah. I feel like, so for YouTube, I have to outsource that. I have to use the team. It's like, it just needs to be at a higher quality. It's a lot more involved, the editing. But for TikTok and Instagram, I don't know if you can tell, but I edit it myself. <laughs> I did it myself. <laughs> it's, um, but I love how it can be a lot more scrappy and homemade and that way I can do it myself. And so you can show techniques. You can show the correct way to cut a pepper because I've been watching a lot of videos on the internet and I think a lot of people don't know how to cut a pepper and it upsets me, so I had to make a video on how to cut a pepper. Um, okay, now it's, it's buried like two years back. I'll have to pop it <laughs> forward so people can see it. Are we talking like a Thai chili pepper? Are we talking like a capsicum bell pepper? I just think people are just making it too complicated. You take the bell pepper, you put it on the side, you lop off the end and then you lop off the top and then you can just take out the whole center without like losing a single seed. Anyway, I, I've got a demo. I'll link it up we'll later. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, That's just a random thing. Most of them are not bossy, like you're cutting your, your vegetables. <laughs> I'll say there's so many people who are so happy to be bossy on the internet. I'm, <laughs> that's not my vibe, except for about peppers and also about, um, you know, sandwiches. sandwiches yeah, <laughs> <coughs> sandwiches. <laughs> Only about peppers and sandwiches. Am I bossy? Were you surprised at? Well, will you give a 30 second summary of grilled cheese sandwich <laughs> And then were you surprised at? In the year of 2022, I decided to refresh an old recipe. As in the, you know, it's a perfect September recipe. It's cream of tomato soup, classic style, and grilled cheese sandwich. I guarantee you crave this one day in September every year. And I made a little video, and at the very end, I cut up all the grilled cheese sandwiches I'd made us for dinner, and <sighs> the comments were hilarious. I feel like my soul gasped. Um, I, I was so excited about this, and then <gasps> It was like, like a needle screeching off a record. Apparently, I do not cut my grilled cheese sandwiches the correct way. I cut them the wrong way. And not only that, but people have so many opinions. And unlike so many things on the internet where people have a lot of opinions and it's kind of exhausting, this is hilarious. It they is. were some of the funniest comments I've ever read. I wanted it to go on forever. It was so, I loved, people were like, you're so good spirited. I'm like, this is funny. This is hilarious. <laughs> this is like low stakes rage. <laughs> um, yes, the best kind. But I was asking, like, do you cut it diagonally? Do you cut it this way? And then I gave people like four options to vote for and they were like, where's number five anyway but the way you do it? <laughs> um, so apparently, I, so I cut it 
a cross. Like hammer. Ooh, you guys are returning your books, are you? Don't look at the bodega style egg sandwich. You're going to be very upset, okay? Um, <laughs> I've been trying to warn you guys that just don't look at that page. Um, I thought that the goal of cutting a sandwich was that it should be the shortest way across a piece of bread because the idea is to keep the sandwich guts inside the sandwich. Sandwich guts. And if you have a long cut, your the sandwich guts are going to spill out of the sandwich. And I don't understand how that's the goal. Um, so. <laughs> And almost everything, I think your way is the right way. You should cook, you know, you know, buy, shop, do what makes you happy, do what works in your life. But you're all cutting your sandwiches wrong. This, <laughs> on this one, I really feel like I'm probably, I'm probably right here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm picking my least Love popular that, opinion yeah. and dying on that hill only. <laughs> I mean, okay. So, how do you cut your sandwich? I guess it depends on the sandwich, but I don't. I'm sorry, I don't know if I've ever cut it. <laughs> anywhere but short you way, way. <laughs> like hamburger style, <laughs> latitudinally. I don't know the. Well, okay. so what I learned is that people are like, well, if it's this kind of sandwich, I cut it this way, and if it's this kind of sandwich, I cut it this way, and if it's this kind of sandwich, I'm like, see, you guys are complicated. I am simple, Your shortest system. way across every day, all day. Like, anyway, I love this. <laughs> I mean, I really do love this conversation. <laughs> I I was. I, I think you're right, it was objectively hilarious, but I was so surprised to see people have so many sandwiches. I shouldn't have been, I work on the internet, I know, <laughs> I know. like I know what it's like, but. But they were so funny, yeah. people had the funniest <clears throat> stuff to say. Do you know to this day, at least every day, somebody tags me in like three different sandwich cutting memes. <laughs> oh, and then it went viral, because then it was like the Washington Post wrote about it in a few other places. And some people were like, is it a snow slow news week? But most people, no. it was hilarious. Are it was important. just so nice to have something like Time to argue about. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of comments, it seems to me like your comment section is one of the best places on the internet. So too. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I, I told you I read through recipes. I also don't think I've ever cooked a recipe without reading the comments mm -hmm. ever. And your comments that, that I've made this section, I, I mean, it's amazing. It's so great. Do is it? Is there a lot of curation happening there? Is it just generally a, a great place? I'm also curious, like how much you take feedback. Sometimes I see you kind of in there and responding, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't. Like, how, how much time do you spend thinking about the <laughs> comment section? So, when I'm not book touring, because this, no this is not my normal, like, this is my, nothing in my life is like this. Nobody ever applauds when I walk in the room. <laughs> very, very <laughs> upset about that. Um, Got to have a talk to my family when I come home tonight. Um, so this is not, when this is not my normal. So normally I try to check in just every day or every couple days and just see what's happening. Um, I have to curate very little. I mean, every so often I have to remove spam, but I don't. I mean, twice a year I've removed a comment that was like, Amazing. like absolutely so unhinged Nazi that it would have to like it would detract from the rest of the conversation. But it's very rare, and I think it's because the vibe has been set and because yeah. I do show. Usually my rules, I try to respond to questions. Like if it's a question I can answer, I will try to answer it. So when I check in, that's what I'm doing. And of course to remove like spam and sure. stuff like that. But that's that's about it. I think the conversation is just very pleasant. Yeah. I think Smitten Kitchen readers are very nice. Um, and most people just want to talk about what worked and what didn't work. And also when I'm making a recipe from the site that I haven't made in years, I'll go back for a refresh in the comments of like things that have come up for other people that I want to look out for when I'm making it again to see if they were concerned for me. So I've seen you, I'm, I think I'm thinking of your like strawberry summer cake, mm -hmm. that recipe, that's a perfect recipe. I make it all the time, the small one and the big one, and now mm -hmm. it's stacked in your cookbook. I know, right? I love Beautiful. that one. I can't wait to strawberry season so everybody can make it. And the little ones from Union Square Market, which you kind of name drop, I think, in one of those recipes. But that, <laughs> you've started it in one pan, and then a couple years later you made it in another pan, if I'm remembering correctly. Like, <laughs> And maybe that's just because it's a good cake and you wanted mm -hmm. people to have more of it. Maybe you noticed that people were kind of doubling it and you wanted mm -hmm. to do that. But how, like you get this kind of immediate feedback, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious, like, okay, you just published this big, beautiful cookbook. Is it nice not to get immediate feedback? Does it feel <laughs> weird? Or is it actually like not true that you're not getting feedback because people are so kind of tapped into your social? literally terrifying. Like it is the most terrifying thing. I cannot breathe until like five people have successfully made me reach recipe. <laughs> so November was not a good month for sleep for me. <laughs> it was not the sleeping as much. No, I have to, I, lo I need to like, so it's, if I publish it on the internet, I usually know within a day yeah. whether it's working for people. And even though I am testing these things, it's just like I need to see somebody else yeah. making it until a bunch I of people had made the ricotta nofi and the green spaghetti and the, 
everything else, I, so it's actually terrifying waiting for the feedback yeah. um, so far. So good. And people are cooking. I mean, you're posting on Instagram the photos and it's, it's amazing. I can't even keep up. I, don't, I feel like I didn't do this last time, but this time I'm definitely trying to collect the pictures. I'm trying to find some way where I'm not resharing 300 pictures a day. <laughs> But every few days, I have a nice collection of things that people have been making. And I love to see how it comes out for other people. Yeah. And um, so far, I haven't, I don't think there's been any major concerns. Not that I would tell you guys. I'm just kidding. Yes, I would. <laughs> yeah, don't make keepers. The, don't make the angry pizza in a glass pan. It sticks. I, I didn't know anybody made pizza in a glass pan, so that's not in the head note. But um, don't make the pizza in a glass pan. Um, yeah, Hot that, that's really about it so far, but give it more time, I'm sure. Love that. Some one stars will appear. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. Um, Thank you. I am just keeping an eye on the time. We have some audience questions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a quick lightning round for oh you. We didn't talk about this in advance. <laughs> um, okay, kitchen tool you use most frequently? Small offset spatula. Perfect tool. Uh, favorite recipe in the book? Oh my goodness! Um, shoot. Uh, well, now we're talking about the chocolate chip walnut oh, cookies. They're so good. I know, okay. but I, I can't. All right, it's, it's a mood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the spice you think most people should cook with at home, but don't. Uh, spice. Spice ingredient condiment. Oh God, I. <laughs> what is wrong? Um, I love sumac. It's okay. so random. It doesn't yeah. have a strong flavor, but I love the lemony, soury mm. paprika. I think it improves a lot of It's like both visibly pretty and it has a nice little flavor to it when it's fresh. I never cook with sumac, so I've gotten a major it's, takeaway. I think it's more of a finishing thing. Love so that. Just sprinkle it on. All right. Um, favorite non-NYC food city? I mean, I just had such good food in Minneapolis oh. last week. Do you know they have so many donut shops there? They have <laughs> so many donut shops. I was like, I can get to one. Um, apparently picked the wrong one. I don't, it was delicious. They had brown butter glazed donuts, and that oh, was the yeah. one I wasn't supposed to go to. Can you imagine the one I was supposed to go to? Um, so it's whatever I was at most recently. But I'm going to be in Austin tomorrow, so Fine. sorry, Minneapolis. <laughs> Tacos. Tacos. Probably. Um, the question fans ask you the most. Do my kids eat this? And then I'm like, which one? <laughs> I have two. <laughs> one eats, one doesn't. <laughs> one, one does not believe in my cooking. <laughs> Fortunately, the other one came first, though, so it's fine. So, well, this is how I say it. At any given time, 70, I, any dish I serve has a 75% approval rating. That is higher than the president. Okay. <laughs> so sure, there's this one person who hates my cooking and food in general, but you know, it's just, it's 75% guys, so I feel like that's, how does that spin? It's a win. Like, must spin doctor. Um, and favorite dish for somebody else to prepare for you? Ooh, what do I want somebody else to make for me? I like it when my mother-in-law, who's here tonight, makes um, stuffed cabbage. Yum. It's very good. I don't think it's too hard work, I just want somebody else to make it. <laughs> Love that. Okay, I'm gonna ask some audience questions. Uh, what has been your biggest cooking disaster? Oh my goodness. Well, I did slice my finger up yesterday <laughs> making fennel. That was just idiocy, though. I don't know if that was a cooking disaster. Um, I'm not very good at making croissants. I'm completely okay with that. Like, they're okay, but like, there's just, there's no reason for me to go through that effort. But if you are somebody who goes through that effort and you happen to live in the Lower East Side, please call me. <laughs> I want to be friends. <laughs> Have you tried the croissant cereal? Do you know what no. I'm talking about? No. Oh my gosh, there's a place in Brooklyn that's doing like $50 croissant, little mini croissant cereal. Okay, so Brooklyn has croissant cereal, but they don't have 14.5 ounce cans. Listen. Of I'm just <laughs> taking notes here. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think I need to try that. I feel like yeah. I feel like I could I could get into that. You have to like wait in the line, and so I haven't tried yes, it yet, okay, but that's not gonna happen. I, I will. <laughs> and if you live in Park Slope, please come find me and tell me where you're buying your tickets. <laughs> Um, what would you cook if you were making a meal for the president? Oh my goodness. Let's see. Um, so I love, this is just the thing I always want to do in February, so I want to have a mussels and fries party. I love to make like a big, big, big pot of mussels, like wine, love butter, that. lemon, herbs, and then you make a lot of french fries, like a tremendous amount of french fries. And then a big green salad, some white wine. I think, you think he'd like that? Yeah. He'd like Chic. that. Love it. Very, I feel like People don't cook them at home that much, and you really can, and they come out great. So, great answer. Muscles and fries. You had that one ready to go. I'm really yeah, impressed. Yeah, it's what I want to do right now. <laughs> but I'm going to Austin after Austin. Um, did you ever think you would write a famously popular recipe for buttered noodles? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no. I just was like, I don't know how to tell you that I have nothing else I can write this summer. <laughs> so you're supposed to like write from where you are. I was zip zero out of content. Like I was at a, I was like, I either write about what's happening or I, or the site's going to be silent for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Will you give the like? Oh seconds? yeah. So what happened was my son went to sleep away camp last summer, and um, so my approval rating plummeted. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I was left with this child who really only wants to eat buttered noodles. And um, I didn't really know what to do because, I mean, you, theory, you think I could just, like, my husband and I could cook what we want, but it's summer. We're happy to have, like, a caprese salad for dinner. Like, that's also not a recipe we're going to be running every day. So um, I basically just decided to make buttered noodles and just keep making buttered noodles. Like, you know, but I call it buttered noodles for Francis. It's like the bread and jam for Francis. So I decided to just make it every day and see when she got tired of it and then we could maybe move on. And honestly, that day has yet to come. <laughs> so I had to write about it. And so I said, this is how I make buttered noodles for our Francis. And a lot of people relate. Uh, I also love buttered noodles. Like, I yeah. totally get it. Maybe not every day forever. Um, anyway, what ultimately happened is my son came home from camp and I started cooking a diversity food again, and that's it. <laughs> do, you, um, do you generally have a sense of which recipes, when you like, hit publish on them online, are going to kind of pop off or are going to do the best? Is it always? No, not really. I don't okay. have a huge... I mean, obviously, chocolate is chocolate, and a one-bowl cake is a one-bowl cake, sure. and broccoli is surprisingly popular. Broccoli. Broccoli. Um, is surprisingly popular, but um, no, not always. It's not always a clear thing. It's cool. Um, but so it's always fun to see what kind of connects. Yeah. Even in the book, um, I was uh, telling Matt from Kitchen Arts and Letters earlier that I put this um, salt and vinegar charred cabbage in the book because I wanted some weird stuff in there that I love. Everyone's making it. I was like, this is just for me. I wasn't making this for you. I just wanted some weird stuff in there that I love to eat. And I love how many people are just, like their kids are eating it. Like the people who don't like cabbage are eating it. It's just, it's like they get kind of crispy. It basically had started as, um, Sorry, so much for short answers. God, this is why my head notes are so long. <laughs> it had started. <laughs> it had started as I wanted to do something with salt and vinegar potatoes because potato, salt and vinegar potato chips are god level potato chips. And then I wanted to like, well, maybe I could turn it into more of a meal by adding some cabbage to the sheet pan. And what happened was, the potatoes were the least interesting thing there. They were like not good at all. But it was the cabbage that was the star. We were picking off the cabbage. So love that. Here you go. Um, I didn't know. I did not expect anyone to make that. <laughs> Great segue to the next audience question. Thank you for that, stranger. Um, people have been cooking from this book like crazy since pub date, true. <laughs> Is there a recipe that's been overlooked so far? So I think that nobody has made the strawberry summer stack cake yet, which is the strawberry summer cake in a layered cake form. Um, and it might just be because strawberries are out of season and yeah. catastrophic, catastrophically expensive right now, but also they're not very good. Don't buy, don't, just wait, wait till summer. It's not worth it. Um, so I think it's mostly summer dishes have not been cooked a lot, which makes sense. But that is also a recipe that is selfishly just for me. My birthday's in June, which is the middle of strawberry season. All of you guys are like, oh, she's a Gemini, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I just know that people say that after I tell them my birthday is in June. <laughs> Um, anyway, I made that recipe for me. I always wanted it to be a layer cake, and I, you really think you would just make three of them and stack it up. It's, it turned out to be far more complicated <laughs> to get it right, but I can't wait to make it again, too. I, I love that cake, <laughs> as previously said. This person also says, thank you forever for the pot rack recommendation. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, all right, do you have any advice or tips for converting things like baked goods into gluten-free? Is it using gluten-free flour? Do you have any advice? Is this something you think about when you develop recipes generally? I definitely think about it, but mostly because I've gotten so many tips. This is definitely reader-fed tips mm -hmm. over the years. I would say that definitely find a gluten-free baking flour mix that you like a lot. I know people really like the cup-for-cup cup one, but there's a lot of other ones out there that probably cost less, and maybe you make your own homemade version. I think there are certain things that usually work pretty well, quick breads, you know, layer cakes. These are things that are fairly forgiving. I think when you start getting into drop cookies and shortbread, it can be a little bit trickier, but not always. Um, so I think it's really just a little bit of trial and error. But most things work with the good gluten-free flours out there these days, which I think is really cool. I did not say sourdough. There's a whole book for that. <laughs> um, although if you really want to get into sourdough baking, um, Aaron Goyaga has a new uh, uh, a gluten-free uh, baking book out. I'm forgetting the name, but it's amazing. And uh, it's incredible. And if you have anyone gluten-free in your life, you should buy it. I'm very good at marketing for my own book right here. <laughs> 
do you think like when you're developing recipes either for a book or kind of you know month over month over month for the for the website oh okay like I am thinking about I won't use vegetarian as an example because as a vegetarian I think you do an excellent job with that but making sure there's enough things for people who might have certain dietary restrictions mm -hmm. oh okay I've done enough gluten-free or I've done enough keto or whatever the thing might be vegan is that something that like is top of mind for you it's definitely it's not top of mind but it's definitely in there when a recipe has two tablespoons of flour I'm like okay <laughs> we're really gonna throw the whole gluten contingent off for two tablespoons like yeah. how is this really doing the work there so that's something I think about or if it's just a very small amount of parmesan like is, is it really or to mention that it could be optional or at least yeah. test it both ways so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in the book and especially I know it, it, I came up a lot in my last book um, where I'm thinking about like is this is this significant or is it insignificant yeah. Um, and like there's a pancetta, white bean, and Swiss chard pot pie in the first book that I almost never make with pancetta. So it's in the meat section, but it's actually an amazing vegetarian <laughs> pot pie. Noted. Like a little bio. Yeah. Sorry. It's amazing. <laughs> and not to like plug our comment section again, but I feel like there's always people who ask those questions mm -hmm. and there's always so many responses from other readers. So I think that's so special. I like really that. amazing. Um, okay, I have a picky eater question. Mm -hmm. How do you manage having a picky eater? Isn't it devastating? One of my three-year-old twins won't eat anything and I'm heartbroken, I'm so sorry. Um, how have you not given up? She does eat butter noodles like Francis. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you keep spirits? It is so, I actually, I'm glad you used the word heartbreaking because that's a bit how it feels because you were so excited to cook and you wanted to make this thing and this person was like, yuck. <laughs> um, like I said, one of the ways I've been able to process it a little better is that my older kid is the one that likes the food, and so we kind of were set up, you know, already, and then this interloper came in, and she, like, hates everything. <laughs> um, I would say, don't take it personally. It has nothing to do with you, even though they specifically say it was you and you ruined this dish. <laughs> don't, don't take it personally, and I also feel like this is not necessarily gonna help you with the specific situation, but I feel strongly that whenever you get a chance, you should try to cook the food that you love. Find some way to fight for the things that you love to cook. So I'm assuming we're all here, because at some point we enjoyed cooking. We enjoyed it, it was fun, and then real life, and maybe it was, you know, troll-like children who hate your food, <laughs> or just job confines, or the price of groceries. Something happened and it gets in the way. This is just real life. How do you get it back? I think you get it back by cooking the food that you really want. And I know that's not the easiest thing, you know, it's easy to say it. It's another thing to actually do and be like, so here's the spicy pilaf mommy wanted for dinner. There's 92 ingredients in this. You're gonna love it. <laughs> um, but sometimes for me, it's about breaking out. Um, I, I used to, once upon a time, I had a column at Bon Appetit where I used to write about this stuff. Um, this picky before eaters. your years there, yeah. yes. But it's yeah. all about picky eaters. I would talk about like breaking it out. Like, so maybe we keep the black beans and the toppings separate. And if there's anything you can do Think of it as fighting for the things that you care about, you know, to get the food that you're craving. And maybe you do have a bowl of buttered noodles on the table just because they're very easy to make and reheat in the microwave. And then you can put out something new and you never know. You can be like, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like this at all. This is, this is not your thing. And sometimes it works. <laughs> that's great advice. And um, that's our talk. So Deb Perlman, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Deb will be signing books, which are for sale in the art gallery for, uh, following this. And I just want to say thank you so much, 92NY. Thank you, Kitchen Arts and Letters, who's selling the books. Um, thank you to all of you for the great questions and for listening. And see you later. Thank you.